The fact that NASA covers things up, the fact that NASA just constantly lies, the fact that NASA turns off the cameras every time a UFO comes into view on some kind of orbital platform tells you that, yeah, you can't trust NASA. But from that, be careful, folks, from that, you cannot conclude that the Earth is flat just because NASA lies. And so what I'm doing here is discussing what I think is right and wrong about flat Earth theory, you know, from, from a point of view of, of real physics and science, the laws of physics and how the universe works and so on. All right, we're back on the Alex Jones Show. Mike Adams here stepping in. And yes, in this segment, we are going to get into flat Earth theory. So if you've got friends who are advocates of or critics of flat Earth theory, which seems to be this exploding uh, phenomenon, for, for whatever reason, a lot of people are, are interested in this discussion. Uh, we're going to delve into that in this segment. And uh, just a quick little background. You know, I, I, I work in the realm of science every day. I run a science lab. We do mass spectrometry every day got multiple mass spec machines, you know, analysis of pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, and things like that. And so, you know, take it for what it's worth. Everybody's got a different view on everything. But I want to say up front, uh, I'm convinced the Earth is a sphere. However, I strongly agree with the process of questioning everything, and I welcome that process. So I'm going to go into that here. What does the flat Earth theory get right? Or what, what do flat Earth advocates get right? And perhaps, in my view, what, what are they getting wrong? And what's great about this whole conversation is that here we are, free speech, independent media, you know, we can talk about these things right out in the open. We might not have the same, you know, views on them, and that's okay. But I'll give you my views, and you can take it for what it's, what it's worth, and um, maybe it's convincing. I am going to give you a method, by the way, that you can use a, a rifle scope to confirm that the Earth is a sphere. I will give you that method here at the end of this segment, and you can try it yourself. Has to be a certain type of rifle scope. But let's get into this. First of all, what is what are flat Earth theorists uh, doing that's correct, in, in my view? Uh, number one, they are questioning everything, and that's awesome. And that's exciting, in fact. Uh, the, we, we're being lied to in so many ways by the globalists, by the banks, by government, of course, and even the realm of science and medicine is filled with so much BS, you know, we're, we're questioning it every day. I mean, I research vaccines all the time. I research pharmaceuticals. I research a lot of science topics, and I find that the establishment is constantly lying to us about everything, including NASA, by the way. And so when flat earth theorists talk about, hey, NASA is lying to us, uh, the government's lying to us, that there are cover-ups, when they say those types of things, they are not wrong. They are not wrong to question these big narratives. In fact, NASA has been lying about the presence of life on Mars since at least 1976, when the first Viking lander, or I, I think it was Viking 1, maybe it was Viking 2, but uh, Viking lander, 1976, and uh, the, the scientist's name was, I think, Dr. Frank Levin. He should have gone down in history as the first scientist to have discovered life on Mars, because they were looking for microbial life, and they use a simple mass spectrometry uh, instrument. And so that was over four decades ago. They knew there was life on Mars, but they covered it up. So NASA has been lying to us all this time. In fact, that scientist, Dr. Levin, knows very well. They ruined his, his career, his reputation, in essence. They shut down his experiment after it confirmed the presence of life on Mars. Second point, and I've covered this on the show here too, NASA believes there is an atmosphere on Mars. And the way we know this is because NASA is sending a dual rotor helicopter to Mars with the Mars Rover 2020 mission. Now, helicopters, you may recall, don't work in a vacuum. And even though NASA says officially that the atmospheric pressure on Mars is only 0.6% uh, that of Earth's, they're still sending a solar-powered helicopter there to fly around in basically a vacuum? Doesn't work. Propellers don't work in outer space and they don't work in vacuums. So the only reason NASA would send a helicopter to Mars, and by the way, it's called Scout, and it's um, Bridenstine, I think the NASA administrator has talked about. It's been all over the media. It's called Scout. It's gonna fly ahead of the rover. Uh, this helicopter would not fly unless there were an atmosphere. Now, if there's an atmosphere on Mars, it means that NASA has been lying to us for decades. And that is true. I'm convinced that NASA is lying almost all the time about almost everything. Now, does that mean the Earth is flat? 
No, not in my view. Does that mean the moon landings were faked? No, not in my view. And I'll explain my view. But on that point, I want you to know, like, look, I'm the founder of Brighton.com, the video platform. I welcome your videos on these topics, even if you disagree with me. I welcome them. You're not going to get banned on Brighton. You're not going to get banned because we support free speech. We support people having different points of view on these things. I noticed it wasn't long ago that YouTube was saying they're going to ban what they call fake science videos. And they mentioned, I think, Flat Earth. And they also mentioned concern about GMOs or anything that countered the narrative of vaccines. They're going to ban all those videos on YouTube. And you notice how they lump all that together. So anytime they want to attack uh, GMOs, or I mean, critics of GMOs, or if they want to attack uh, vaccine skeptics, for example, who they call anti-vaxxers, or if they want to attack people who believe there is a globalist government, which there obviously is, <laughs> it's openly admitted now, but they always throw in flat earth. Why do they do that? Because in the minds of the mainstream media and the globalists, they think that they can use flat earth to discredit anybody, anybody's beliefs in other areas. They try to lump them together and say, well, gosh, these people believe vaccines are dangerous and they believe in flat earth. And so that's a tactic that they use. And by the way, there's no doubt in my mind, there are some elements of the flat earth uh, movement, a few elements that are probably controlled opposition. But most of the people who are pursuing flat earth theory as a thought experiment are actually well-intentioned people. They're curious. They're curious about the world around them, curious about the nature of the universe. They're curious about why are there all these secrets about Antarctica? Why is no one seemingly allowed to go there, right? Why do some things that we've been told over the years not add up? And that process is extremely valuable. And I celebrate the process of asking really big questions, even though I may disagree with you on the conclusion. Now, the other thing that flat earth people get correct is to say that consensus in the realm of science doesn't mean anything. So for example, people attacking the flat earth theory will often say, well, there's scientific consensus that the earth is a sphere. And, but those same people say, well, there's scientific consensus that carbon dioxide is bad for plants and will destroy the planet. So you see, scientific consensus can be wrong because carbon dioxide is a nutrient for plants. Carbon dioxide is turning the planet green. So if 97% of scientists, they say, agree that carbon dioxide is bad, then I would say that 97% of scientists are idiots, complete morons who don't understand basic atmospheric chemistry. So consensus does not equal truth, even in the realm of science. So that process is correct by flat earthers to say, well, consensus doesn't really mean truth. I agree with that. I still disagree with their conclusion. I, again, I believe the earth is a sphere. I believe that uh, the planets orbit the sun, right? Uh, this, this, this is what I'm convinced is true. But I agree with the process of questioning these things. And I agree with the right to speak and the right to ask big questions. So I, I just want to be very clear that that's my position. Now, there are some ways that you can, you can prove to yourself that the Earth is a sphere. I'm going to get into those in the remainder of this segment and also the next segment. Now, uh, I welcome anyone to, uh, to, to challenge these. I welcome discussions. You can post videos on brighttown.com, like I said. You can post articles, whatever you'd like to do. We totally welcome that process because we are not we are not the, the science high priests of absolute truth like the vaccine industry claims to be. We are people who are willing to ask big questions. But I have run some tests, okay? I've talked to some flat earthers and I've run some tests that they suggested to me. And the test proved, in fact, the opposite of what they told me. The test proved that the earth was a sphere. So here's what you're gonna do, the first test. You can do it with a rifle scope. You have to use a rifle scope that has milliradians in the scope. Those are just called mills if you're a long range shooter. Now, mills are measurements of uh, angles, essentially. And if you look at the moon through your rifle scope, you can measure the number of mills that the moon takes up in your scope picture. That number of mills, according to flat earth theory, at least as I understand it, they say it should be different if the moon is straight overhead versus if the moon is at the horizon because it's moving much farther away from you. But in fact, if you run this experiment yourself, you will find the moon is the same milliradians no matter where it is in the sky, indicating the moon is equidistant from us at all times. I'll have more straight ahead, more experiments that you can run. But look, I agree, we should question everything. 
Much more straight ahead here. Mike Adams, Infowars.com. We'll be right back. And we're back with our discussion of Earth and space, astronomy, flat Earth theory, and much more. A quick correction, I inadvertently in the previous segment referred to the NASA scientist who built the experiment that discovered life on Mars as Frank Levin. It's actually Gilbert Levin. At least I got the Levin right. At least I didn't say Mark Levin. <laughs> like the, the first scientist to discover life on Mars and master the Constitution. Uh, no, it, it's, it's Dr. Levin. And again, the reason we have trouble remembering who this guy is is because they erased the history of his amazing discovery. He was actually called on the night that they discovered life on Mars. He was called by Carl Sagan, who congratulated him for the greatest discovery in the history of science, and then NASA covered it up. So the fact that NASA covers things up, the fact that NASA just constantly lies, the fact that NASA turns off the cameras every time a UFO comes into view on some kind of orbital platform tells you that, yeah, you can't trust NASA. But from that, be careful, folks, from that, you cannot conclude that the Earth is flat just because NASA lies. And so what I'm doing here is discussing what I think is right and wrong about flat Earth theory, you know, from, from a point of view of, of real physics and science, the laws of physics and how the universe works and so on. And uh, just to recap the last segment, I agree with the premise of asking big questions and being curious about the universe. I also want to add, uh, I'm not attacking people who are part of this movement, who are advocating this theory. I think most of them uh, are, are motivated for good reasons of curiosity, intellectual curiosity, and they have constructed some, some very interesting, what I would call thought experiments about physics and how things work. So I'm not attacking them. Again, I think their process is very good. I just, I disagree with the conclusion, although there probably are a few controllers or controlled opposition people at the top who are really pushing this to try to discredit anybody who has a quote, alternative theory about anything you know, whether it's uh, vaccines or GMOs or, or what have you. Now, I mentioned this experiment that, that you can use to prove that the Earth is a sphere. Well, essentially you're proving that the moon is always the same distance from our planet or, you know, very close to always the same distance. The, the orbit of the moon is not exactly a circle. It is very slightly elliptical, but it's so slight that it's not even worth considering. So we can, we can, essentially say that the, the moon's orbit around Earth is, is a circle. The moon is equidistant from Earth. So what you can do, like I said, just to sum up last time, you can take a rifle scope that, that, is, that has a reticle in milliradians, or what are called mills, and you can measure the size of the moon in your scope. And the size of the moon will always be the same in your scope, whether it's directly above you or close to the horizon or somewhere in between. That contradicts what was explained to me by a prominent flat Earth theorist who uh, wanted to, he wanted me to run some experiments to see if it was true or false. And he told me in a quite a lengthy phone call that the moon is, according to him, the moon is much closer to the earth than we've been told. And that the moon uh, is a disc, I think he said, or maybe another kind of flat object in the sky. And that the moon and the sun move sort of parallel to what he called the flat earth and they move farther away and, and they appear to disappear over the horizon. And then they come back uh, around, you know, kind of circling the perimeter of the, the flat disk, he said. And so he said that if I look at the moon and measure its angular size, that the moon would appear to be larger when it's directly overhead and then much smaller as it gets close to the horizon because it's moving much farther away. That was the theory that was explained to me. So look, hey, I'm an open-minded, scientists. So I said, sure, I've got long range rifle scopes. I'll just take this Schmidt and Bender scope off my uh, 338 Lapua rifle here, and I'll point that sucker at the sky, not with the rifle attached to it, right? Because you don't want to shoot <laughs> at the moon. That's just insane. But <laughs> you, you point the scope at the sky and you can measure the moon. And guess what? It's always the same size. It's always the same size. Now, then some people say, well, wait a minute. When I look at the moon on the horizon, it looks bigger. It looks smaller directly overhead, and it looks bigger toward the horizon. So that's the opposite of what the flat Earth theory predicts, at least as it's been explained to me. But that is simply an optical illusion, because when it's close to the horizon, you're comparing the moon to buildings and trees and things that are on the horizon. In fact, if you measure it, and I challenge you to do this, you'll see that the size of the moon is the same no matter where it is in the sky, which indicates the moon is always the same distance from the Earth. So that right there is inconsistent with flat earth uh, theory. The other thing that you can do 
is you can check your satellite dishes and you'll notice that if you take a lid of a cooking pan, something made out of metal, and if you position that lid right over the, uh, the satellite dish that's pointing to a geostationary satellite that's in a single fixed position in the sky, you'll notice that that satellite signal is blocked. And it's a very easy experiment to do. If you're getting satellite bandwidth or satellite you know, TV or what have you, you can easily interrupt that bandwidth by just interfering with the beam between your dish and the satellite that's in orbit. Now, if the Earth were flat, then there wouldn't be geostationary satellites in orbit at that correct distance from the Earth, which I think is 22,500 miles or something uh, very close to that. So the only reason that satellite dishes work is because they're satellites. And the only reason satellites can orbit a planet is because the planet is essentially a sphere. So uh, GPS, for example, how do you get GPS signals out of the sky? Well, there are GPS sat satellites flying around out of the sky, uh, flying around, orbiting around, I should say, around the Earth, to be more precise. So uh, I'm not sure what the flat Earth theorists say, how do satellite dishes work? Uh, how do satellites work? I think their theory, if I'm not mistaken, is that there are no satellites. And uh, I, I don't see how that can be reconciled with uh, what we know to be true about, about how satellites work and satellite dishes and GPS and so on. Again, I'm not, I'm not attacking anybody personally over this. I'm just saying that uh, satellite dishes work great and uh, GPS works great. And uh, in fact, GPS works at very high altitude. Uh, the other day, I was actually sitting in the co-pilot seat of a jet uh, as we were up at, I think, 37,000 feet. And uh, a friend of mine was allowing me to fly since I have uh, flight experience. You know, I, I'm trained as a pilot. So I was, I was there actually, you know, adjusting altitude and uh, adjusting our heading and things like that. I was actually flying the jet, which is pretty cool. I mean, you know, with assistance. But um, from, from the co-pilot seat at that altitude, you can absolutely see the curvature of the Earth. And as I've heard it from flat Earth advocates, they say that when passengers look out of the windows on the airplanes, the reason it's curved is because the windows have a lensing effect and the, it makes the Earth look curved. Well, uh, okay, but I was looking from the co-pilot seat right out the front of the cockpit and I can see that the Earth is gently curved. Uh, from that altitude, saw it with my own eyes. And I, I'm sure if we went higher, we would see even more noticeable curvature. And by the way, those, those jet windows are not lenses. If they were lenses, it would be dangerous to fly because they would distort everything. In fact, they're manufactured for optical clarity and for uh, allowing light to pass through unaltered. Otherwise, jets would be slamming into each other and the ground and mountains and terrain all the time. So I've actually seen this for myself sitting in the co-pilot seat of a, of a jet. Uh, there are other things that you, that, that you can do. The only reason I address all of this is because this seems to be a growing fascination. And I love that process again. I love the fact that people are interested in the universe and how things work. But if you ask me, the big cover-up is not flat earth theory. It's, and I don't, I don't know if, if it's okay for me, me to even say this, but it's about life on other planets. That's the big cover-up. And we talked about, you know, Mars. Life has been on Mars or discovered on Mars since 1976. And if there's life on Mars, there's life all over the cosmos. We live in a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, which itself has anywhere from uh, 100 to maybe 250 billion stars, depending on which figure you believe. Around each of those stars, there could be habitable planets like ours. And whether you believe the universe created itself spontaneously for no reason, like Stephen Hawking says, or that God created the universe, Either way, why would we be the only life forms in the planet? If God created the universe, God created life everywhere in the universe as well. God created the Big Bang, so to speak, and God put life everywhere. Why would we be alone in this vast space? And, and the Milky Way galaxy is only one of hundreds of billions of other galaxies as well. So we're talking about you know, beyond human comprehension. There is life everywhere in the universe, in my opinion. I mean, every, I should say everywhere that there's habitable planets, right? not obviously in the vacuum of outer space, but that's the big cover-up. NASA's been covering up life on other planets and intelligent civilizations interacting with our civilization here on Earth. That's the big cover-up as far as I'm concerned. And I think NASA is about to allow more disclosure on that point in the, in the coming years. In fact, they've already dropped hints about that. So that's my take on it, folks. Uh, I welcome uh, differences in views. I welcome your free speech. I welcome your scientific curiosity. 
about how the world works around you. Uh, I'm with you on that journey. I'm also just trying to figure out how we got here, where we are, what's the purpose of life, what's the meaning of the universe, everything. I'm with you on that journey. And we got to ask big questions, but we also have to follow the evidence as closely as we can. So thank you for watching today. Mike Adams here for the Alex Jones Show. Kind of an interesting segment today. Uh, Owen Schroyer is straight ahead with the War Room. Stay tuned for that. And thanks for joining me today. Silicon Valley thinks you're a dumb jellyfish. They think the West is dead. They think if they censor nationalists and patriots off the internet, you'll just forget about us. And then they'll be the only information out there. Well, so far, that's not been working too well for them. Thanks to you spreading the word steadfastly that the resistance to globalism is alive and well at band.video. And now we've added a lot of new functions and a lot of new hosts and contributors to band.video. So please bookmark it and check it daily. And even more importantly, tell folks about band.video and realize that you can take it with you anywhere you want on your quote smartphone to put our free app on your device in defiance of big tech whether it's apple or droid you simply click the share button on your phone and then add to home screen and then there's nothing the scumbags can do the power of america the power of freedom the power to build a better world and stand in the face of the censors and the tyrants is alive and stronger than ever at band.video but it's up to you to unleash its full potential band.video Taking advantage of one of nature's most nutrient-dense ingredients, VasoBeet will be your new favorite InfoWars life formula. Using only water and beetroot, VasoBeet is the most concentrated liquid extract of beet on the market. With concentrated beet extract, you can get the high levels of betaine, nitrates, and antioxidants you want to help support a healthy liver, athletic performance, blood vessels, and more. Don't overlook the power of beetroot. Get your naturally occurring potassium, folate, vitamin C, iron, selenium, zinc, vitamin K, and more. With one of nature's greatest treasures in VasoBeet from InfoWars Life today.